It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 37, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today is Steve Tomlinson. Steve manages Great Road Farm just four miles from downtown Princeton, New Jersey. Making its home on 112 acres, Great Road Farm has over seven acres in vegetable production in close partnership with Agricola Restaurant in Princeton. A graduate of Brooklyn's Pratt Institute, Steve worked for artists Christo and Jean-Claude to build an expansive installation called Gates in Central Park and managed the warehouse before starting over working on farms after the 2008 financial crash. We talk about how Steve leveraged his background outside of agriculture into managing Great Road Farm, the joys and challenges of working for a farm that is owned by a restaurateur, and the nuts and bolts of working with the chefs and restaurants to meet their needs and the farms. This was a super valuable episode. I love some of the details that Steve got into about how he manages his relationship with the restaurants. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Vermont Compost. Founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com. Steve Tomlinson, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. It's great to be here. I'm so glad that you could join me today. This is I really appreciate your making time here in October. I know uh, New Jersey's not exactly Wisconsin when it comes to the climate, but you guys have got to be in a pretty busy season with winding things down right now. Yeah, we are. Um, I was just out there covering up our salad mix with Remay because we're going to have our first frost this weekend. So I'm still busy. To get started here, can you tell us a little bit about Great Road Farm and and in brief, your relationship with Agricola Restaurant? Because I think that is kind of what makes Great Road Farms stand out from all of the other great farms out there. So Great Road Farm is, it sits on 112 acres. Um, We have about seven acres in vegetable production or cover crop. Right now, you know, this year we had about five acres in in vegetables. Um, we have four acres fenced in for pasture, for livestock. We raise a small amount of livestock, such as sheep, uh, two cows, six pigs, uh, 200 chickens for eggs. And we are attached to a restaurant called Agricula, and it is owned by the same owner. His name is Jim Non. He owns the farm and the restaurant, and I am the farm manager. So I started here about four years ago, and I pretty much started the farm. Um, it was just, you know, land. And yeah, we've been rolling it ever since. So you got hired to actually start Great Road Farm. What was your background before coming to Great Road Farm? I actually went to art school at Pride Institute in Brooklyn, New York. And so I started off as an artist. Well, that's that's a logical career path. Yeah, that's what my parents said, too. Um, <laughs> So I was an artist in the city for about seven years, and I found my way eventually to an eco-friendly building supply company. Uh, One of my designer friends was starting up a a new startup, and he asked me to to jump on board. And so I did. So I ended up driving forklifts, managing a warehouse, doing whatever it took to get this startup off the ground. Um, And then around 2008, the economy crashed. And I lost my job and I had a chance to kind of start over. Um, I had a lot of fun designing products and furniture, but I didn't really want to do that because I kind of felt like I was just making landfill. Um, And I was really interested in how I could kind of help, you know, do something good for the world. So I looked at possibly going back to school for ecology. And once I looked at going back to school for ecology, I searched where the students sometimes end up and they started, I started finding that people were working on farms after they graduated from ecology. So I decided, you know, this is my third career. I'm going to short circuit going to school and I'm just going to jump right into farming. Um, so right there, I just started off at, you know, on a uh, Blooming Glen farm in Perkisby, Pennsylvania. And I just started off as an intern. Um, 
back then, I probably thought I knew a lot and I could fix every problem that the farm had. And after another two years interning on other farms, I realized, wow, there's a lot more to know about farming than <laughs> what I thought. So I fell in love with it. And, you know, at that point, I really had a goal. And my goal was to manage a farm after three years. Because at this point, I'm about 29 years old. And I had to, I really had to make this my career. Um, so I was all in. And from there, I rented a half acre from North Slope Farm. That's where the farm I was last. I was an intern there. I went through the training program. Uh, Mike Rasswater is my mentor. He, was, he really helped me out. And he let me farm on a half acre. So, you know, every farmer has to have a winter job. And at that point, I was struggling really bad to find, a, you know, just a temporary job in the winter. And I said, you know, if I'm going to take any job, maybe I should go into a restaurant. But I was a little hesitant because I was never a server. So I took a winter job dishwashing at a vegan place right down the street from my house. And to me, I thought this is kind of my end to start working with chefs. And I kind of always do it the hard way where I'll go and wash dishes for three months to make sure I can see the back of the house and talk to the chef. Um, So that chef, his name was Ross from Sprig and Vine in New Hope, Pennsylvania. He sat down with me and he gave me a shot. I said, I am a half acre I can grow. Uh, What vegetables do you want? And what's the quantity? And he just went through the seed catalog with me and just told me everything that he wanted, when he wanted. And it was an amazing experience. So, my last year working at North Slope Farms, like my third year interning on farms, um, I got this half acre and I worked on my half acre after I was done farming for my job. And I also worked on the weekend. So in a sense, I was kind of trying to burn myself out to see, is this really what I want to do? Um, so I was working nonstop. Right. And then I always use my, you know, with the, I try to always use my skills. So one of my skills is, you know, having an art background. So I knew, okay, this is like my portfolio. And so every vegetable that I sold to Sprig and Vine, I took a photo of and made a website. And the job didn't really exist yet, but it was, I was like, I love working with chefs. I like to see the whole connection. I want to see it from, you know, when I grow it to how it ends up on the plate and the planning behind that. Um, and so I said to myself, really, actually, I said to my dad, he said, so what are you going to do next? And I said, well, I want to stay in this area and I want to work with a restaurant and I want to start a farm and manage it. And sure enough, two months later, in the, I was looking through the NOFA New Jersey ads. It simply said, have a restaurant starting a farm called Jim. And so I called him. <laughs> And sure enough, it's been great ever since. Um, you know, there's um, the farm, you know, we just break even, maybe pay a little, make a little bit of profit um, after paying off capital expenses and my salary and health benefits and all of that. So, you know, we are a functioning farm, but the whole goal of the farm is to really supply as much as we can to Agricola and also to what we can't supply to agree to, uh, I reach out to other local farmers as well and try to get their vegetables in because we really need like a whole community working together to run a restaurant that is, you know, 200 seats. Um, so I want those other farmers to stay around. So that's kind of where I'm at now. You're going out to other farmers and, and helping to source the produce for Agricola. Yeah, we're at the beginning stages of that. Um, so I had a lot of farmer friends around here and they're we're kind of all doing the same thing where it's a, you know, someone's farming anywhere between two and 10 acres and they're, you know, right down the street about my age, we have pop lucks together. And if a that needs something, you know, I try to call my friends and say, do you have this? Can we use this? Or what do you have too much of? Um, but it's at the very beginning stages of that because there's a lot of logistics involved with, you know, when chefs start ordering, um, and they kind of want to order from one place or two places and not have a whole entire list. So, but, uh, yeah, well, I'm starting to feel it out. Um, 
and, and figure out the sources. But I am involved in the kind of the executive management of the well, I'm the farmer and I meet with, you know, the chef and the owner and the farm house manager um, every, you know, bi weekly. So it's, uh, I, I wear many hats. So tell us how the, your relationship with the chef at Agricola actually works on a, you know, on a, on a year to year basis and, and even on a, on say a week to week basis, how, how are you guys doing the planning together and, and making sure that you have what the chef wants and making sure that what the chef wants actually aligns with what you're able to produce there in New Jersey? That's a great question. And you know, it, it changes all the time, but, um, Basically, I sit down in the wintertime and we go through the seed catalogs and we try to guess, you know, the chef tries to tell me what he likes and I try to match production to to what I think they need because now after my fourth year, I kind of have a feeling for it. Um, and it's really, I go back to, you know, record keeping from the year past to make sure that, you know, what I'm saying, what I can actually produce. And that's the beginning. Um, then when the season actually hits, you know, chefs are kind of interesting because they almost want to be inspired by what's out there. Even though, you know, I'm kind of a design background, I'm designing, you know, as a farmer, you're planning the whole entire year out in the winter time. The chefs aren't doing that as much. So there is some flexibility. And I've worked with a couple of two different chefs now at Agricula and each one has its own different style, really. So Chef uh, Crawford Cullinger, he is the current chef now. Um, I can cut in salad mix and bring it to him, and it can be a mix of lettuce and person and lamb's quarters and pretty much mustard greens, whatever I want to grab, and he'll use it because that's what he likes. The other chef only wanted head lettuce. So um, I just try to match what they want. And then, again, what I can't produce, I, you know, they get from other farms. There's not too much pressure to, you know, if they run out of something, we're not going to have the dish at the restaurant. Um, right. Because it's quite, it's a quite a large restaurant. We run through a, it's actually an interesting app. It's called Slack. And it, um, it's pretty much like a group text messaging. And all the cooks and the chefs are on there. And so I put my, my availability list up, and then we can talk about it from there. Um, they, the chefs try to stop out at the farm. Um, and sometimes that works, but sometimes when they're working 80 hours a week, it's not possible. Yeah. Even though you're, I mean, and you're right outside of town, right? You're just four miles from Princeton. That's right. And one, one of our cooks, um, his name's Dan. He, he's kind of our butcher and we worked on, he helped me with raising some of the livestock here and he's out here all the time. And so he relays the information to the head chef as well. Um, one of the most exciting things we did this year was just preserving lots of vegetables. So really trying to be as efficient as possible so that we can have stuff in the wintertime. You know, we put up like the chefs put up like 4,000 pounds of heirloom tomatoes for, you know, just jarring them for sauce wow. or whatever else they want to make. So I didn't waste a single tomato, you know, I mean, any cracked one right into the fridge that week, it was processed. Um, they put in a lot of overnights doing that um that was work that they did that wasn't that's not you doing that processing that's you making sure that they've got the product but then they're actually doing the preservation work yeah there's a real push and pull because if i have all these tomatoes i mean i totally overwhelm them with tomatoes and there gets a little bit of a friction point and then we figure out okay we have to save it and so then we do it and the same thing is with um you know napa cabbage you know, the first year I grew, I had like, you know, 1,500 pounds of Napa cabbage. And I was like, okay, you guys, you know, I, I overproduced because it's still kind of learning how everything's going. You know, then they made kimchi out of it. And it was a hit. And they had it all winter long. So I'm starting, I realized that I can, I can push them when I, you know, pick a vegetable that I really feel good about and I think should be in the restaurant. And then they can kind of, you know, say I need uh, kale all year long or, you know, not all year long, but nine months out of the year. 
And so right. I produce kale for them, not a problem, because there's the kale salad that's on the menu that everyone loves. And I know kale is very trendy right now. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a really popular dish. So kale grows right here in New Jersey. And so I give them, you know, I give them about eight cases of kale a week. So that's kind of how it works. Um, we also have, back to preservation, we did a lot of, uh, we made a lot of hot sauce this year, too. I dried uh, escalette peppers to make into um, paprika or chili flakes. We're still going to try it. And Yum. lots of pickles, too. So pickled zucchini, if we have too much, and we've got you know, just a regular pickles, too. It's pretty exciting. That's a really great asset to have. I mean, it, it sounds almost like having a restaurant as a CSA member. Um, you know, to be able to, to be able to take that surplus and do something with it, which, you know, was one of, if you go back to the kind of the original CSA concept rather than designing boxes, it was more about, you know, providing a portion of what was available on the farm and having people be able to do something with it. I, I really like that. The, the fact that you've got that ability to, to move that produce to the, to the restaurant and have them actually do something with it. I know I've turned, I've turned under a lot of Napa cabbage in my time. I'm sure. I mean, they, they weren't too happy when I produced, you know, 2,000 pounds of kohlrabi. In fact, they still talk about it. And it's like what? kohlrabi was like on every single dish. <laughs> okay, what is it with kohlrabi? Because, like, everybody grows kohlrabi, <laughs> but does anybody actually like kohlrabi? I don't understand that. Um, You know, it's a great... I, I grew a lot of it because it stores well, right? And I grew this huge variety of Cossack, so, they're, you know, I can get my value out of it when I sold it. Your and, kohlrabi as big as your head, right? Yeah, exactly. If you slice it, they made a kohlrabi salad at the restaurant. So they slice it very thin. They actually did like um like a beet they put like a beet dressing on there so it dyed it red. It was beautiful and it tasted delicious. But I mean I agree with you. I I, I can't sell kohlrabi at a farmers market we go to and no CSA member wants it either. Um so that's, that's my kohlrabi story. So that's kind of an interesting thing that you've got going on there as well is you're, you're owned by the same guy that owns the restaurant and, and the restaurants your I think your primary customer, but you're also doing CSA sales. And I think you're still doing a farmer's market as well, right? Yep. And we do a little bit of wholesale. So our CSA is very, very small. It's like 30 members and it's more of a half share. They're not your, it's for one to two people. Um, we started that where people were actually picking up at the restaurant, um, the CSA bags. Now we've kind of transferred it over to the farm because it got a little bit much. Um, and then we do a farmer's market at the Princeton train station. And to me, it's really important to have all these outlets to make sure that I get the most amount of value I can out of the crops I'm growing but then also have a place to, you know, unload when I have too much. Um, so over the course of the years, I've gotten it very efficient. And we run very, very, uh, it's a small crew. It's me and three other workers. So there's not a ton of people out here doing it. So it's important to keep that, keep all those outlets open. And to make sure you've got a market for absolutely everything that you produce. That's right. You said you sell to other, you said you do wholesale as well. Is that wholesale to other restaurants or is that going to grocery stores? Um, in years past, we did, we went to, we sold a little bit to a distributor until that kind of didn't work out anymore. Like Shishito peppers. And I made a lot of money off of Shishito peppers that one year. And then Shishito peppers got really popular. And so a conventional guys started growing them and then it wasn't worth me growing it anymore. So I tried to find a little niche you know, vegetables that I can kind of sell. Um, we also sell to Brick Market, which is right down the street. It's a nice market. Um, we, we just sell them kale. That's what they want. And then we just recently got hooked up with a company called Fresh Nation. And they come and pick up at our farm and pick up at the farmer's market stand. And they're kind of like an arm of Amazon, I believe. Um, it's a new company. It's a new startup. They might be in their kind of trial phase. And, but as far as going to other restaurants, I've tried in the past and I keep sending lists out and they don't respond to me. <laughs> so I stopped kind of doing that model. Um, cause I think it is very difficult to sell to restaurants unless you have a real relationship. And 
there's lots of other farmers around here that, you know, mm. there's a lot of competition. It's hard to even get into farmer's markets around here. So I kind of just, I put all my effort into mostly Agricola and then the other outlets um, just as backup. Farms that I worked on uh, when I was getting started sold to restaurants. It was very much that way where we sold to, we had a relationship with really with one restaurant and we, we sold stuff to a lot of different restaurants, but there was this one relationship that was kind of the primary relationship. I mean, it was the one where the chef got excited. We were in communication and it was clear that the farm and the restaurant really had a relationship. And then there were a lot of other smaller accounts that we dealt with, but certainly not to that same degree that, uh, that we dealt with that, that one key buyer. Yeah, it really is all about a relationship. I mean, that's the that's the key word, you know. When you, if I sit down and talk to the chef and say, hey, you know, why, why haven't you been out on the farm recently? And then he tells me that, you know, he lost a bunch of prep cooks. I'm like, okay, I get it. Um, you know, if, if I have a bunch of vegetables that I'm like, okay, I'm going to have turnips coming. I have a lot of turnips coming. If, if the chef comes out and walks out into the field and sees all the produce that I'm talking about, he's like, okay, we're going to make this work. So <laughs> just making sure you have that relationship open, you know, like any relationship that you want to have strengthen, um, that's how it works. And the better you have, the better communication you have, the better it is. Well, and I really like your what you just said about having the chef come out and and see when you say we have a lot of turnips coming, what that actually means. Um, yeah. I mean, I remember I remember working with some institutional buyers uh, at my at my farm, and they they were like, "Well, we we'll, we can buy, we'll buy all of the I, I forget what it was. I mean, it was all of the rutabagas that you can grow, and and we were like." you don't understand that just how many rutabagas we can grow, you know? And I think sometimes getting that visual for what is a lot of rutabagas, because to them, a lot of rutabagas was a hundred, 200 pounds, you know? Right. And I was dealing in tens of thousands of pounds of rutabagas and they just, they didn't have any conception of what that actually meant until they came out to the farm. And I showed them like, this is what a half acre of rutabagas looks like. And that's right. what we got, you know? And, and that, that kind of, that kind of communication, I think in some ways you almost can't substitute for, for that eyeballs on and that, that kind of eye to eye face to face relationship with the, with the chef. Yeah, you can. And there's a lot of education that's involved in understanding how the chefs work and how they order um, and what they're expecting. So even if I go into the walk-in and see like vegetables that aren't from our farm, I check it out and look at it. Like this is what they think a beet size looks like. And I remember, you know, what I was calling a regular size beet, they were calling baby beets. So you need to have that understanding of sizes. And then the other thing is, you know, I try to let them know we're if you're getting we're like a single source farm. And I use that word as if we're gonna have different sizes of vegetables too, like beets, for example. There may be some smaller ones and some larger ones. We're not sitting here and grading it for them. I guess we could, but I try not to because I try to sell everything. So just the reality of the local produce that it's not coming from California, it's not necessarily in a box that it's all uniform sizes. It's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, you need to find the right chef that can kind of work with that and use that strength for the restaurant. Uh, Cause I think people notice it when you see it on the plate and that things are a little too perfect. Um, but I always, you know, strive for high quality stuff too. Well, that's a, that's that place where that, that definition of quality is really a fuzzy thing. You know, I mean, is quality about how long it lasts on the shelf? Is it about how many nutrients it has? Is it, is it how, right. is it about how red the beets are? Or is it about the fact that all of the beets are exactly two and a quarter inches in diameter? You know, mm -hmm. so I think, I think that becomes, I like what you said about, about going into the, the walk-in at the restaurant and looking at the product that's there to get an idea of what's the language that, that my customer's using about the product that I'm selling them. You know, what is a regular sized beat? Um, are there, are there other things that you've discovered in the, in your chef's cooler that have, that have kind of informed how you communicate with the chef? Um, I mean, I guess just how people, I mean, it's mostly how people pack things and how they, I guess how they store them as well. Um, like seeing all the kale cut up and put into Cambros and, and just how they prep and, um, 
even how they, I guess, use a carrot, you know? Are they peeling it? Are they dicing it? What are they doing with it? That informs me that how big it should be. Are they going to use it whole? Um, so I'm constantly, you know, going in and I, they do a tasting menu uh, or a tasting every couple weeks. So I go in for that. So that is actually a great place where I can kind of be an advocate for my vegetables and say, hey, look at this dish. What about using, you know, this is coming down the line. How about using that instead? Um, and then if I know that they're going to, you know, do whip turnips and puree them, I'm not going to worry if there's some of them are split and it's got a dry split and it's not rotting. I'm going to give it to them because it's not, that's not going to matter. Um, if they're saying to me, like, I need, you know, turnips at three inches diameter and that's it, and that's because I'm doing a dish a certain way, then, you know, I'll oblige to that. So yeah, it's very, it's, it's an education. You have to, you have to really be into food and the culinary side of it. Um, and that's what I really appreciate about working here is because my mind is constantly going about what we're doing. And, you know, I try some new varieties sometimes and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I grew a bunch of celery. I thought it was delicious. It had full, it was full of flavor. And they were like, okay, we'll make celery soup. The celery was way too fibrous. It almost like, they were like, it, it was going to break their blenders, I guess. I guess. So, <laughs> you know, some things don't work out. I guess I grow very fibrous celery, you know? You know, it's, it's constant learning. I don't, I, don't stop, I don't stop learning. Well, and I think that's, that's really key, especially in something like a restaurant market where restaurants are high turnover environments. You know, chefs, chefs have a tendency to come and go and, and trends in the food world have a tendency to come and go too. You know, I mean, who would have thought five years ago that kale was going to end up being what it is today in terms of, in terms of, you know, popularity and seed shortages and all the rest. And I think that, that we, um, it's easy to, it's easy to sit back on your laurels and go, Oh yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm, you know, I produced salad mix 20 years ago and I'm going to keep on producing salad mix. You know, it, it's, you gotta always be looking for what's that new thing and how can you do stuff a little bit better? And I really like the fact that you've got this opportunity to work with the chefs, not just on the level of, I need turnips, but I need turnips to accomplish this. And therefore the quality standards are that I would imagine that creates some challenges in communicating with your, with your harvest staff about, you know, it's not just like, okay, go out and pick the turnips the same way we picked the turnips last week. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, I'm, I'm out there with the staff. We're like, I say like, we're like a pot of dolphins that moves through the field. I mean, we just, you know, I, I lay down what we're going to do. I'm out there harvesting with them. I'm checking their work, you know, pretty much every year I get a new, a new set of people that I train a lot of training up front in the spring and then now we're kind of coasting. Um, so it does take a lot of communication. Um, but since we're harvesting for the restaurant three days a week, you know, and most of our sales go right there, it's, it's all worth it. It's all worth that effort. Um, because there's nothing really more disappointing than going to a farmer's market and then coming back with a bunch of stuff. Um, this just, you know, it, it's an order that it sells. So you're delivering to the restaurant three days a week. Are you harvesting and delivering on the same day? We harvest the day before and then we deliver the next day. And why do you do it that way? Uh, that's just so that I can wash all the vegetables. We take a lot of care in, in washing the vegetables, making sure all the cells are turgid by, you know, submersing them in cold water for 20 to 30 minutes. Um, just to make sure everything is going smoothly. And then delivery first thing in the morning is the easiest thing for us as far as traffic goes. You know, Princeton's not a large city or town, but it gets, uh, there's a lot of people walking around, so it's better to get there early in the morning. And their walk-in at the restaurant isn't very large, so we got to make sure that we can give, you know, deliver three days a week. Um, yeah, I think that's a really big deal working with restaurants. Is I, I don't think I've ever been in a restaurant that had a large enough walk-in cooler. So I noticed, I noticed on your website, Steve, that you had gotten certified organic this year. And I thought that was an interesting marketing decision, given that most of it's going to the restaurant that's, that owns the farm. Can you tell us a little bit about what was, what drove that decision to, to get certified organic? So 
I got asked to be on the NOFA New Jersey board. Um, and after meeting with the group for, you know, two years and learning the history of organic agriculture, I realized that I did want to be a part of it. So I always practiced organic agriculture um, for the first three years. And I kept records because that's the only kind of farms that I've worked on. And I didn't really think, I didn't really hold too much value to the name. I kind of, you know, back then I maybe tried to use the word beyond organic and that really pissed off a lot of people. Um, and I didn't really realize what I was doing that it was kind of, you know, if you want this movement to move forward and you grow this way, then you should just go ahead and do it. Um, and also I noticed, you know, when you go and visit other farms that are kind of saying, yeah, we practice organic procedures, but we're not certified. And then if you notice some certain things that they're doing that is out of those lines, how do you then, are you going to start regulating them? And it just goes all back to, you know, it goes back to marketing, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to, if I was saying, oh yeah, I practice organic procedures, another guy is saying that too, but he's, I see something that he's doing that I wouldn't do and is not organic, then what do you do from there? So I made the decision, you know what, I'm going to get certified organic. I'm going to support NOFA New Jersey and the organic movement here. And I think, you know, I already have all the records, so it's not a big deal. It took me a couple of weeks in the wintertime and I got certified organic. It, it actually made me a better farmer um, because it made me, it forced me to look back at all my records and keep really good records. Um, so it wasn't that, it wasn't that big of an effort for me. Um, and I was amazed by the response. I mean, just people were really happy that we were actually certified organic. Uh, so does it matter for the restaurant? Probably not so much, but as a member of the community and as a farmer that tried to reach out to other farmers, I think it, I think it has a huge impact. Well, and I know and respect a lot of growers who, who've chosen not to be certified, but I do find it's just, it's a nice, clear, bright line. There's, there's not a lot of gray area with it. And, and I think organic certification has its shortcomings, but, but it really is a, you know, we do this and we don't do that kind of a thing. And that's, I think that just makes the marketing easier. And I think it helps customers feel more at ease. And it, it certainly, I've seen that same thing when I visited farms who say, well, we're, we're organic or, you know, we're, we're doing some other certification and, and, and then you sort of, you know, you find out that, oh, you know, well, well, they use treated seed on this thing because they couldn't find it. Or, you know, they sprayed a little roundup over here because, you know, there's no other way to really get that this is under control. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, right. that's just, that's, that's different. That's really different. Yeah. And I get the people that, you know, don't want to get certified because it's a government label and it's a marketing label and they're against the man. I, I understand that, you know, but I think it's, uh, once you grow up a little bit and you realize, okay, this is, there's more to it than just, you know, me. Um, it's a, it's a broader movement and it's got a lot of a deep history to it that I think it is important. And, you know, I'm not growing vegetables like they're growing in California. We're not monoculture. We have tons of stuff, you know, we're not just growing lettuce. Um, so, and actually on our farm, we don't spray anything and we never have. I don't use black plastic mulch. And, you know, I rotate my fields. I plant them then once and then just once a year. And then they're turned over to cover crop or they're fallow. So, you know, I kind of farm extensively and, you know, I really care about the health of the soil. So, um, not everyone does that, even that, that are organic, you know, there's lots of things you can do, sprays and whatnot. I always find that really interesting. I've had a couple of guests on the show who said that they, they don't spray anything. And I always just find that really shocking. I mean, like, do you, I mean, how do you keep the worms out of your broccoli? I don't grow broccoli. <laughs> well, simple solution there. I like that. That's easy. I mean, sometimes I do. I don't grow certain varieties if I have a lot of trouble. Um, like, especially broccoli. I mean, I, I feel like it takes up, you know, it's so much, so many, it's such a heavy feeder too. Um, but I grow most of the other crops though. So, and I don't spray, you know, I planted kale out in the fields in the summertime and it got bitten by flea beetles. It was torn up. And so I just let the field go, you know, and then a couple weeks later, 
we had some porter germination in our salad mix, and that's a really important product for us for the farmer's market. And I went and looked out at that kale field, and there's weeds, and there's lamb's quarters, and there's person, and it's all growing up around this kale. And I was like, well, we're going to add that into our salad mix. So there's a lot of fun going out there and picking all these weeds, or so, so quote-unquote weeds. Um, and then after about a, you know, another two weeks, the kale and the chard, and the, it started to come back up, and it's starting to look healthy again. So then we went through and we cut out all the weeds and laid them down in the pathways. And now, you know, they're not the healthiest plants, but we're, they produce for us. And it's just a little bit later and they got stunted. Um, so I do techniques like that. And I'd rather just keep planting than be on a program to spray um, for flea beetles. Well, and how nice not to have to put on the monkey suit, you know, and uh, yeah. strap on the sprayer. That's uh, my least favorite job mm-hmm. on the farm. I mean, I'd, I'd rather muck out the pig pen than, than have to go out and spray. Yeah, me too. I mean, one the you know, when I worked at a, the first farm I worked at, we sprayed a lot of fish emulsion on plants. And I can remember one time that nozzle got clogged. And, you know, this is like right before lunch. And I sprayed myself in the face like three t- tr- times trying to unclog it <laughs> right before lunch. <laughs> it was just, just horrible. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break here and get a word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Vermont Compost Company, makers of living media for organic growers since 1992. In the transplant greenhouse, all of your investment in plant materials, heat, labor, and overhead depend on the performance of the media where you expect your plants to grow. And that media has a really hard job to do, produce a healthy plant in just a few cubic centimeters of soil. When I started farming, I focused on getting the cheapest ingredients I could find to make my own potting soil, and later on finding cheap potting soil that was already put together. But I found what so many farmers have that saving money on inputs doesn't always result in increased profits. Jennifer at Vermont Compost can tell story after story of customers who switch to less expensive options, but who have come back to Vermont Compost for the consistency and the quality of their potting soils. And even though it's not all about saving money, Vermont Compost's pre-buy program can help you get what your plants need at the best price, with the best shipping options, delivered at a time that works best for you. Plus, their shared truckloads program organizes shipping to other regions in ways that get shipping prices down to the level you'd pay right there in the great state of Vermont. Feed the soil. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheeled tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but they are truly superior pieces of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability that every farm needs. I've worked with BCS tractors for over 24 years, and I wouldn't consider anything else for my small tractor needs. And I'm not the only fan. More than 1.5 million people in 50 countries have discovered the advantages of owning Europe's most popular two-wheeled tractor. And these really are small tractors, with the kinds of features found on their four-wheeled cousins and a wide array of equipment. Power harrows, rotary plows, flail mowers, snow throwers, sickle bar mowers, chippers, log splitters, Ah, you name it. You can probably put it on a BCS. Check out bcsamerica.com to see photos and videos of BCS in action. bcsamerica.com. And now back to our interview with Steve Tomlinson of Great Road Farm. So tell me a little bit about how your background has influenced the way that you farm. I mean, I noticed when I was when I was reading your about page and some other stuff that I found about you, you know, you've done a permaculture design class um you know, you've got a, you've got this background as a, as an artist and a designer. You even worked with Christo and John Claude on this installation in Central Park in New York City. How has that manifested itself in your farming operation? Well, each, each portion of my life, you know, I've been, I've been building skills, I guess. So my first job out of college was at the, was working on the Gates project uh, for Christo. So I saw an ad in Craigslist. It was like, come work at a factory in Madison, Queens for $15 an hour. And I was kind of hungry for work at that time. And I said, okay, I'm going. And I thought I'd be in like a can factory or something. I walk into this place and, you know, it's an immaculate warehouse, giant. And there's all of Christo's prints on the wall. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. 
So I got that job just being a, I manufactured the gates basically. So material came in, I was on a chop saw and I was cutting the same piece for months at a time. Um, and doing it's basically logistics and, you know, light construction. Um, that really taught me, um, just how to work really hard and kind of do the same task and not lose your mind, I guess. Um, you know, there's one point on that project where I put nuts on bolts for three months, just oh, wow. eight, hour, eight <laughs> hours a day. <laughs> so very tedious, right? And then when you look into it, it's like, how could anyone do this? But I always saw the bigger picture, which was the gates. You know, I don't know if you know how Christo works, but he does all of his drawings and collages before the, the project actually goes up. And then he funds his project from those drawings and those projects. So that to me is like a beautiful concept. And it's kind of about having vision and understanding where it's all going. So I was in it and I worked there for two years. I even ended up training, you know, 3,000 people how to raise the gates up in Central Park. I was driving around Central Park and, uh, you know, dropping off material. I worked with an engineer and actually helped map it out. That was probably one of the coolest jobs I got. And I was the only person that stayed on the entire time. Um, so that just taught me like hard work, keep your head down, you know, look at the bigger picture. And, you know, a project like that really had a, had a pretty nice impact on the community. So I think being a part of that little piece really helped solidify that I'd like to be a part of a, you know, a larger movement, I guess. Um, and then from there, I started working in metal shops and wood shops, and I started a design company with a partner. And we had the opportunity to go down to Argentina for a design show. So I got to see the world a little bit and just get a taste of how to build like a small business too. Um, so that kind of all led up to basically what farming is, which is totally satisfies my creative need at this point. You know, I don't really have a desire to design anything unless it's something that's going to be functional that the farm needs. And that when I found that it just, everything kind of fell into place. I felt, um, I felt like I knew what I was doing. I knew why I was doing it. And I had these skills of building and designing that I look at farming as kind of like a whole systems design, um, that, you know, it just, it just really fell into place. I noticed that one of the things that you're doing on your farm that I don't see very often is that you have a mixed production system where you've got a certain amount of ground that's in raised beds, permanent raised beds, and then the rest in more of a standard agricultural production layout. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, about how that system works? Sure. Um, I learned the permanent raised bed technique at North Slope Farms. So that was one of the farms I interned at. And I really enjoyed that because basically I built the beds on contour. So in, in the event of a weather event, um, you know, they're not going to flood out. And I do all of my direct seeded crops in there. Well, not all of them, but most of them, such as, you know, salad and carrots, turnips, radishes. And so we actually seed across the bed and we seed just wide enough to get a scuffle hoe in between there. And we find that that really helps with weeding and staying on top of it and for harvesting too, uh, because no one can really make a straight line with the pinpoint seeder we're doing the long way. Um, so that's the real intensive production that is you know, right at the heart of the farm. So when you walk up there and you look at that solid mix, and you see weeds, we know we're going to weed it. When when you say a permanent raised bed, is that a is is that something that's got you know wooden wooden borders on it, or is this just basically a a, a mound a mound that you're not walking on? Yeah, this is just a mound we're not walking on. So they're about four three four feet on top, four feet wide, and then it's got a slope probably about you know six feet bed to bed, and I have it. It's a very undulating, just low slope um, shoulders so that I can get a mower across that when I need to, to clean everything up. So we basically just use, we spread compost. I had a little compost dropper that I found off of Craigslist. And then we use a broad fork and a walk behind rototiller. Um, 
And then we used like a, the Johnny's bed prep rake, which I really like, just smooth it out so it's really flat. Um, I feed uh, white clover in between the pathways. Um, and, you know, of course, there's grass always come up too. It's easy to manage after everything's done. I can just get a riding mower over the whole entire thing and clean it up. And then the rest is in more of a, of a traditional farm setup. That's right. Um, I have all half acre plots. Um, the beds are about a hundred feet long and we have two tractors on the farm. We've got a large Kubota M7060 and we've got a cultivating tractor. And so with the larger tractor, I actually have a spader and a mom spader, which is nice. We just got it uh, last year. And so I, I, I use the spader to do my primary tillage. And then I switch right over to the cultivating tractor to do my bed forming, just so I can get pretty tight beds in there. Are you buying in your compost or is that something that you're making on site? Uh, we buy in our compost. It's uh, mushroom compost from Kennett Square. Um, and certified organic, and it seems to be working out pretty well. We do have a horse side of this operation, which I'm not really involved with, so we do have access to manure. But And I've tried composting that in a slow way you know, over the course of two years, but there's still a lot of weed seed that comes up. So for right now, we're just we're still buying, we're buying it in. And so that's part of the farm. I mean, this I think this is one of the interesting things about working for somebody else on a farm is that a lot of times it's not just about about producing and making something that's that's financially viable as just a farming operation, but it's also about satisfying these other needs. Do you get other? Do you get other? I mean, you mentioned the the horse manure. I mean, do you get pressure from the farm owner to take on projects that you wouldn't do otherwise? Um, I don't know about pressure, but I get asked to do lots of different things. I mean, there was one point that I was. You know, I was farming, you know, full time, running the farm, and then I'd I'd send my workers home, and I'd come home at like, you know, five or six, and then jump on a mower till it got dark to make sure I completed everything that I needed to. But now it's all kind of equaled out, and they've got the appropriate help. So, but if there's a fence post miss, you know, broken, I'll I'll go and fix it. I mean, I pretty much do whatever that needs to be done. But over the course of the years, as the restaurant's gotten pretty strong. The farm has found its own feet. Um, those type of tasks don't get asked of me as much anymore, um, especially since I am involved with the restaurant too. And over the winter time, I, you know, I, I do more kind of research and, and figure out um, and help, help with the restaurant's direction as, as much as I can. You mentioned that, that you're, you're pretty much bringing in enough income now to cover your expenses. Is that, how long did it take you to get to that point at the farm? Um, the first year we had a loss and that was mostly because the restaurant wasn't open. You know, it, it's always like, Oh, it's going to open next month. And then that just keeps going on and on and on. So we didn't have outlets for the vegetables. So that was really frustrating. Um, it's just me and one other guy. So with this enterprise, I've grown it very, very slowly where the first year it was me and my friend, Sam, the second year, it was me and two other workers. And then the third and fourth year, it's me and three other workers. Um, so it's taken us, I'd say after the second year, we probably lost about $10,000. And then by the third year, we're just about breaking even. Um, but you know, it's funny when people talk about how much money you're making, um, I guess like if I reduced my salary down, we could be profitable, but I'm not going to do that. So, you know, but right now we're, we're, we're looking pretty good. I actually think it's important to think about, you know, paying yourself a salary for what you do. You know, that that's kind of, that salary is your return on is, is what you get for the labor of doing the work. And if you make more than a reasonable salary, then that's kind of, that's your return on investment and the risk that you took with your money in, in buying the tractors and and buying the land. I, I think that's a, I think it's a really, it's a common accounting error. And, and, you know, if you're working for yourself and you say, well, we broke even, that means something really different than if you're, if you're working for somebody else and getting a salary and saying we broke even, you know, those are two right. really different statements. 
So yeah, which uh, I think is important to realize because you know if, if you're there's other farmers that have that have their own farm, it's their own money, and I ask them how they're doing, and they say they break even, and then I ask them if they paid themselves, and <laughs> no, so I don't I don't know how you do that, you know. Well, and it's certainly one of the nice things about working on somebody else's farm and managing somebody else's farm is having some of those capital expenses and not having to, not having to fund that stuff yourself, I think is a, is a tremendous advantage. Um, do you guys do any accounting for that? When, when you talk about breaking even, does that include, uh, accounting for depreciation? Um, yes, it does. Great. So, yeah. So it, it is really good. And, and I'm tracking the numbers all the time, the income of what's coming in. I work on a, a sheet that, um, you know, make sure that we're on track and where we're going. And so I, that's really important to, to stay on track on all that. Um, so I we have help too, you know, since we're, we're connected to a restaurant, we've got people that work in the office that help me out with that. So there's, it's great being a part of a team that it's not, I don't do a lot of office work because we have people that do that. So I can focus on what I need to do farming wise. Um, which is a nice relief. And it's also great because I can learn from people that are experts in their field about how to run a business. And that's what I'm, I'm still interested in and in seeing how it all works together. So. Yeah, that's really great. Uh, especially that part about being part of a team and, and not having to worry about the fiddly stuff, you know, not having to be the guy that goes out and gets the workman's comp policy or the guy that has to do you know, choose, are you going to do the payroll or, or cultivate the kale on a Thursday night? You know, that's, that's a great place to be. It makes my job enjoyable. And I'm, you know, I do get stressed out more in the spring, making sure everything's going off and going good. Um, but you know, as far as, you know, by this time of the year, we're just coasting and I, you know, I'm pretty relaxed. (laughs) I'm like looking forward to December and, taking a break and then starting all over again. So, you know, I, I'm, I think it's important that you don't get burnt out too, because you very easily could. And that's probably to me, the worst is if you started farming for a couple of years, three years, and then you start your own farm and then you just end it, you know? So it's important. I mean, people should think about managing a farm, you know, using someone else's money before they go all in with their own. Um, but, you know, you lose some independence there, too, I guess. And that's what people like. I guess that's what farmers are usually pretty independent people. So have there been things that you haven't been able to do that you would have chosen to do if you were on your own? Actually, I'd, I'd say no, because I'm not micromanaged at all. Um, so it's only added to what I can do. And, you know, to be honest with you, it was quite a leap for me to go to being a intern and then managing and starting a farm. So I was kind of a little bit over my head, but I kept, you know, going to farming conferences, reading, talking to people and really trying to make sure that it was all going to work. And, um, I, I think I'm doing it. So it's, it's only helped me. Yeah. I had a couple more technical questions about your relationship with the restaurant. Um, do you pay, do they actually pay you? How does that how do you guys account for the sales to the restaurant since you're part of the same company? Yes, they pay the farm. Uh, um, you know, as far as it's just a money transfer, but it's okay. all kept on, kept on the books. So I come up with a price that's fair, you know, that's comparable to other organic vegetable prices that local distributors have. Um, and then I charge them and, it's really great, actually. I use um, I use Square, and I have an iPad, and I so I can track where all the vegetables have gone and how much, and it, it really provides a nice output for that uh, information. That's great. Um, when when you're getting those prices from local distributors, where are you coming up with that information? Is that are you working oh. off of a price list that you're getting, or how does how do you get that that data? Yeah, I worked off a, it's off a price list. So, you know, distributors will get the price list to the restaurants and then I get to see that. 
I guess so, that's, yeah, that's a convenient thing about having that relationship, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I get to see the inside workings of it all, you know, and I get more information to be like, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to scratch my head about how much this is worth. This is the market price and this is what I have to sell it within. I can't, um, I think that's the, the easiest way to do it. And then as far as the ordering and fulfillment cycle, can you walk us through how that happens on a by delivery or by the week basis? So you're, I mean, how do you let the chef know what you've got available and then how does he get his orders in and, and kind of how does that whole process roll out on your farm? So every Saturday I come up with a list of what's available. Um, I'll put any notes in there that, you know, if it's limited or if it's a new product, I'll, I'll write a little something. And I'll even take photos too. And I use, we use this program called Slack, which is basically like a group a messaging app. And so all the, co- all the cooks can see it. So I can post photos on there if they want to see what, you know, my mixed green beans look like. Um, they want to see the size of my hot to light turnips. If, they're, if I'm saying, hey guys, I'm in and out. These turnips are really small. Maybe you could use them on a salad. And then I'll, you know, I'll show them a scale image of that. Um, so I give them as much information as I can, you know, sometimes it's a phone call just to discuss the list, but it's all written down. And then from there, they order, they have to order by Sunday night to get a delivery on Tuesday. And that's because we harvest on Monday and they just do that throughout the course of the week. So basically I get the, I usually get the order like, so let's say the order for a Tuesday. So I'll get a message at like one o'clock in the morning on Sunday saying what they want for Tuesday. You know, I, I wake up, we go and we, I write down a harvest sheet, you know, pen and paper. And I give that to my crew and I'm out there harvesting too. We always do, you know, tender leafy greens first and then roots in the afternoon. Um, and then we wash it and we pack it. And as a new vegetable appears, we, we kind of develop what the unit size is. So, you know, I use these blue tubs that I, you can get from Target or Rubbermaid tubs. I use them to pack everything into. Um, and whatever fits in there, it's about the size of a bushel. So, you know, I'll say, okay, this 15 bunches of kale goes into this tub. That's called a case. And so now we've developed our language. So we work like that. Um, and we'll wa- we'll harvest in the morning, we'll wash in the afternoon, and then, you know, the crew will split off and do other tasks that need to be done. Someone will sit there and wash and pack. And I have a harvest sheet that says what we're going to harvest and then the actual harvest. And that's kind of like a checklist. So they write down, when they pack it, they write down, you know, I packed four cases of kale. So they have a reminder. And that is really important because then, well, we also write with a um, erasable pen marker, it's a chalk marker on the bin, what is in there and where it's going. So A for agricola, you know, kale. And the date too, because the restaurant wants to know that. Um, and then from there, it's by the end of Monday, it's all packed in our walk-in, ready to be delivered. Um, I may choose not the person who washed the produce to deliver. I may choose someone else. So now we've got that sheet and they look at it and they say, okay, this is what's going to the restaurant. And they'll pack up our van and then they'll deliver. Um, and then they pick up the bins that were left from the previous order. And then they come back to the farm and we sterilize them, wash them, and, and uh, the cycle starts over again. All right, Steve, let's turn now to our lightning round here at the end of the show. I know you're a listener to the podcast, so I know you're familiar with this. Um, yes. What's your favorite tool on the farm? I have to say my multi-tool that I carry around with me everywhere in my pocket. Um, it's got a knife on it. It's got pliers. I'm using it every single day. If I lose it or I don't bring it with me, I'm just like, and then I'm lost. I'm like, who's got a knife? You know, to me, that's, that's probably the most important tool. That we got. Which which multi tool are you carrying? Uh, the Leatherman Skeletool. So it's nice and light. I actually think that's the one. That's the same one that I use. I like that oh, yeah. one. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I actually because because I'm kind of, I was bad about this. I actually learned to keep two of them around so that when I lost the one, I could immediately replace it. That's a good idea. And, you know, the, the tool's really good, but I've definitely broken the needle mist pliers doing something I probably shouldn't have like about four times. I just saved the receipt and I sent it back and they give me a new one. So they got ornery with me about that. When I broke the needle on those pliers, the woman on the phone was like, well, what were you doing with those? And I'm like, well, I was, I was farming with them, you know? Yeah. Well, if you go to REI, that's where I got mine. They don't question the, anything. You just send it back and they give you a new one. That's a good got company. It. Okay. So that's, yeah. that's the tip there. What's your favorite resource for information about farming? I really enjoy growing for market. Um, I also enjoy acres. I can't always get through every single um, magazine, but I tried to. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, the Farm to Farmer podcast. I listen to. I think I listen to every single episode. Thanks, Steve. To be to be to be mentioned in the same in the same realm as growing for market. That's that's. Uh, I don't know. That's pretty high praise for me. I I remember um, that was that was had just come out when I started working on farms back in the early nineties. And I just, I remember just devouring that. And I think I've read, I've read every issue since. What was the last purely recreational activity you did? The last thing that I did was I went surfing down the shore and that was oh, really? summer time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Surfing's really popular. Our last episode with, with JM Fortier, that's actually was his last recreational activity as well. So oh yeah. Yeah. How, how big do the waves get in New Jersey? I don't, I don't think of New Jersey as being a surfing place. Oh, no one does. Everyone laughs at it, you know? So, um, but if you, you know, in the summertime, it's small, but I have a longboard. They just go out there and paddle around and, you know, I just cruise on the smaller waves, but, you know, when it, a hurricane comes right before, it can get it can get pretty out of control. Um, I used to work at a surf shop, so I still I still love surfing. I wish I could do more of it, but taking farming as a career kind of doesn't really work together just yet. Something to work towards. Yep. And if you could choose a farmer superpower, what would you choose? I guess I'd have to say I would love to uh, be able to fly. I think and hover, so then I could just kind of go over the weeds and, and weed all the beds and get to places back and forth, you know, very quickly. Be a little, a little easier on your back there, right? Exactly. Free of gravity. <laughs> and if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? It would be to always trust your gut. You know, I mean, there's times that I made decisions about, you know, farming. Like one time I tried to get really cheap uh, potting soil from someone. And I knew that it wasn't the right thing. And, you know, basically it was, a, it was a place that had, that was conventional. And I said, well, that's okay. So you use compost. All right. Um, could you take out the liquid nitrogen and I'll just use the same thing. It's pretty much compost and prolite and, and <laughs> the plants were horrible. So anytime that I like, you know, what I tell myself is just, if you know it, if it's not, if it doesn't sound right, trust your gut. I like that. Steve, thank you so much for making time here on, a, on an October afternoon to join me for the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Thank you, Chris. It was an honor. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 37 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast and that you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Tomlinson. That's T-O-M-L-I-N-S-O-N. I'm super excited to announce a series of workshops I'll be doing this fall on employee management. Employees make it possible to get more done, but managing workers and their work takes dedicated time, energy, and processes, as many of our guests have explained. I'll be presenting full-day workshops on managing and motivating employees on the farm in Hemingford, Quebec on Friday, October 23rd, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa on Monday, November 30th, and in Columbia, Missouri on Tuesday, December 8th. By the way, Hemingford is just 90 minutes from Burlington, Vermont, if you're interested in jumping across the border to attend that show. More information, including schedules and registration information at purplepitchfork.com slash better boss. If you enjoy the podcast, I think you would also enjoy my weekly email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. The Flying Rutabaga runs the gamut from practical templates for delegation to guidelines for watering transplants. You can sign up at farmer to farmer podcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. 
Also, if you enjoy the show, it would be great if you would pop on over to iTunes and leave us a review or make a comment on the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. These reviews and these referrals are the bread and butter of making this show available to an ever wider group of listeners. And you know what else? I'd love to hear your suggestions for guests on the show. I know a lot of things, but I don't know all of the great farmers out there. Please visit farmer to farmer podcast.com and use the contact form to tell me who you'd like to hear. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. <laughs>